Hey guys, welcome back. Joe here from 9 to Fivers. We're going to be talking about a topic that's a little bit odd, a little bit out of uh, context or a little bit weird. And it's, I, it came up to me when I was speaking with a, a potential student and she was looking at a property and she just wasn't sure what to do with the property. And it kind of prompted me to make this video because I think it's a really good idea to analyze properties and seeing how you can get the maximum value out of them. So without further ado, let's just get into the overview here. So why does this matter is what we're going to be talking about. Why do we need to get the maximum value out of a property? Shouldn't it be pretty obvious? Uh, what do we need to be looking for? And what is worth really changing? And we are going to assume in this video that you kind of have a, some basic knowledge about real estate investing. So without further ado, let's get into it. So why does it matter? Well, commercial buildings, commercial buildings are valued. It's derived based off of what the building is doing. So think about imagine a car dealership that we had here and it was being used as a flower shop. We're talking like, you know, just the opening entrance, the office there where you would go and sign for a car loan or you would purchase a car there. Uh, if that was the only part of the building that was being utilized, the, the, the building's value would not be getting its full maximum potential uh, that, that it was supposed to be getting. <clears throat> so Commercial buildings are already valued and focused on this. So why aren't residential? Well, it's because a lot of people that are investors, they they kind of look at the residential side of it and they go, well, whatever the other buildings in this area are selling for, that's what's that's what it's worth. And, and I think you'd be listening, looking, uh, missing out on a lot of value here if you are not maximizing a property properly. So you, when you're looking at a residential property, you need to know what the intent is that you're going to be using it for before you purchase the property, before you really make an offer. When you're doing your analysis on the property, you kind of need to know what you're planning on doing with the property. Yes, there could be maybe a little bit of guesswork down the road of like, hey, we might do something here, we might not. But overall, you need to, be, you need to have a pretty solid idea of what you're doing with the property so that you know what the value is of it is before you before you make the purchase so that you know what it is after you're all done you can collect on that cash you could be missing out on big money for sure um, if there's an area in your uh, if your area needs a bunch of four bedrooms but there's no four bedrooms and I know in my the reason why I'm bringing that up because in my personal area you can find a two bedroom and a three bedroom house or an apartment all day but if you find a four bedroom you will get a hundred phone I got a hundred phone calls in two days, less than two days for a property that I had that was a four bedroom. And I've never gotten that a volume of calls on a three bedroom or a or a two bedroom. And this house is in a uh, we'll say a mediocre neighborhood. It's not it's not terrible, but it's also not like the top top. But I got more calls about this house because it was a four bedroom just because that it was a four bedroom and that's it. Going against the grain in an area really does hurt. You don't want to put a, if you're in a high-end neighborhood, a lot of times you don't want to start putting a trailer park into an empty lot and just hoping that the that the, the local neighbors will not come after you or code enforcement. That can be an issue too. Or a single family home of like, say, nine to five people next to a college campus where it's just like all college kids around. That's totally two different lifestyles. So let's look at the surrounding area first, and then we'll get into the house. What is nearby? What, is there an airport? Is there a hospital? Is there a college? Are there, uh, is there, uh, are there large employers nearby? Is there a highway for quick access of, of being able to get on the highway and being able to go to multiple areas? That's important too. Um, you know, you, if you have, if you have access to a highway, a lot of times it doesn't, it might not matter what is close by, but maybe what is close by in regards to maybe a 20 minute or a 30 minute drive on a highway. Um, but large employers are important, especially if they're walking distance. Uh, you don't have to rely on a car or, uh, or, or, or public transportation to get you anywhere, which is great for people that don't, if, if uh, parking is a nightmare where you're at, or if you're in a low end neighborhood who can't technically afford a car and they have to rely on public transportation. Is there, are there, uh, grocery stores nearby. What is in within walking distance is important. College. College is important too because you could be looking at students or the faculty or both and um, you can get people that are near a college that work at a college that are not students or excuse me, they're not faculty 
but are maybe like the groundskeeper or the kind of the people that are behind the scenes at a college that you don't normally think of that work at a college. Same with the hospital and airport. An airport is really nice because you can start up uh, what's called, a, I've, I've heard the term called a crash pad. And a crash pad is basically an Airbnb, except you're only going to be renting to uh, flight attendants and pilots. They would come in there, they would stay for a night or two or a weekend, however, however long they're down for, and then they would get back up and they would leave and they would pay on a per day basis. Um, that, that puts you up against the hotels. And from what I've seen, uh, local investors have a, a high competitive advantage against hotels because your overhead is much lower than theirs. And you can, you can charge way less and still make more money per room than what they would. So it's important to know the local area around for sure. Uh, the area type, what are we kind of, what is the type of the area? What is the, what is the mix besides just like, what are the close buildings? Are, are we in a rural area? Are we in the sleepy suburbs, a township, city, residential office mix, or a tourist destination? Rural, you have to remember here that whoever's going to be living there is probably going to need, they're going to need a vehicle or a car. So is there a garage? Is it attached? You know, do they have adequate parking space? Is the driveway got plenty of gravel in it? Is it, does it have the, um, cement or whatever needed to it do they have plenty of space to stretch out you know a lot of times rural people like to stretch out and by stretching out i mean like they have plenty of land to work with or that there's there's a woods nearby something like that so you kind of have to see you know when a rural you kind of it has to make sense for a rural type person and you also need to know that if, if you're dealing with a rural area you know the the lack of amenities around you uh, will have to be made up in some other way so you might need to supply them maybe with a uh, a commercial freezer that they would put in the basement to, to store all their extra food because going to the grocery store takes them two hours or whatever that is. Sleepy suburbs, that might be, you know, you don't want to maybe uh, if you're planning on renting to say college kids, you know, you don't want to put them, you don't want to offer them a property in the sleepy suburbs because that's where, you know, basically college kids that graduated uh, 10, 20 years ago are living now and they want to get up and they want to get up but they have to get up at 5 a.m and they're and they're going to be in bed by 9 p.m and they got kids and you know you can't be throwing college parties when it's uh you know when when we're trying to go to work in the next day township um that's another area type of situation you know what's the school district like city you know what part of the city are you in is it is it in the rough area rough part is it in the good part is it in the mediocre part is it what is it near what kind of public transportation do we have here? Very important. Residential office mix, that might be something where uh, you might not exactly want to be doing strictly uh, just residential leasing. You know, you might be able to turn a couple, if you have a building or a property that has like a couple of single family, uh, you know, maybe a one bedroom, you could turn those into offices and see if you do, if you cannot make it to where it has different uh, separate access, excuse me, uh, for that property. So always be thinking outside the box. Um, the, the one lady that I had come to me, she said, she goes, uh, I have a, I think it was an eight unit house. And I was like, okay, that's not like, tell me what the setup is. Like, well, there's a two bedroom downstairs and then there's six single bedroom property or, or units on the on the uh, on the upstairs and I was like whoa that's kind of weird I've never heard of that before and she goes yeah and I was like okay she goes I, you know it's been on the market forever and they really dropped the price and I don't know what to do and she was very very panicked she um it was a it was an odd property and, and it was and she was a brand new investor and she, I, I could tell on the phone that she was ready to just any sort of like uh reason to run away she was ready to run away but this was a potentially a really really good deal so I told her, I was like, I talk, I, I go, what's nearby? She goes, there's a hospital nearby. I'm like, okay. She's like, there's also a college nearby. I'm like, okay, great. I was like, all right. I was like, what, like, find out how close you are to each of those places and see which, um, which type of, which type of person or not type of person, which type of, uh, which maybe building would be best for your property. I was like, because, and, and she's like, okay. And she goes, okay. And I was like, put up flyers, you know, talk to people, talk to like the staffing at the hospital, talk to, or start putting up uh, posts on bullets and boards, pretend you're the student and you're looking for a property. And, you know, what are you expecting to pay? And 
um, you know, how far are you willing to go from campus? And she's like, oh, all right. And I was like, listen, the, the bottom section, that two bedroom, one bath, like that's probably going to be a longer term tenant that you could potentially put in there. But the six up top, that are single families. You could get uh, students in there that are maybe on their third or fourth year of undergraduate school, or maybe they're even, you know, going into their master's program in there. And I told her, I go, listen, I think if you rent to people that are in their, in the master's degree, they're extremely focused on uh, their work and they have to get, you know, the grades and they have to do well. I think when my wife was doing her master's degree, she had to get, she had to average a B, like a C was failing basically in the master's program. So you had to average a B or an A. And my wife had zero time uh, during her master's program to like go out, hang out, party. I mean, it was basically work, study, and that's it. And then eventually I just became study. She quit her job and she focused and became a full-time student when she was going through this. And I told her, I was like, if you focus on students like that, they're not going to have time to party, especially in a single family, a single bedroom uh, unit. I was like, try to focus on students like that and just remember that their leases are going to expire, you know, to coincide with the semester. And I know I've heard, I've never had students that were, uh, I've never, I've never really dealt with students too much, but I've always heard from multiple people that have uh, worked with students, like the higher level students that the master's program that are pre-med or whatever it is. I was like, those students, they take the place. You don't hear a peep out of them unless something's broke and they pay their rent. And then they and they leave after the uh, after the semester is over with, and you fill up with the next person. And by that time, you should have a endless supply of students uh, coming in, as long as you charge a relatively fair rate and you fix stuff all the time, and you kind of just let the students like just kind of be. And she's like, okay. And like her whole attitude changed about this property from, oh my god, this is going to be this could potentially be a money pit, to, oh my god, I could get two or if I get two or three of these types of these properties, I could be retired fully 100%. So it is important to know what type of what the property is and uh, what you what you could potentially do with it. And I'll, I'll go to the last one here, a tourist destination. So if it's a tourist destination, it's going to be more of an Airbnb type style of renting. And you can rent these properties out for a higher dollar per day and just expect the turnover to be much higher and expect that you're going to have to fully furnish the property and you're going to have to clean it. It's the hospitality industry versus like the long-term rental industry. Long-term rental industry, you're just basically just giving them paint and carpet and then they furnish the place themselves and they stay there for two or three years. A tourist destination is you have to have everything for them. They pay a much higher rate per day and you uh, can expect for them to stay two or three days. So, if you're not sure what to do with a weird, odd property, or it's in a it's in a, it's in an area that you don't know what to do with, uh, reach out to a mentor or or send up or ask us uh, in the comments below and, and just kind of say like what what should I do with a property like this and we can kind of maybe get a dialogue going or talk to a local investor. Um, um, that always works too. So the crime rate, if it is a low crime rate area or it's a place with maybe a, a good school district where people want to live then it, this could be a flip opportunity or a lease option. And the lease option would be someone that, that is going to potentially, they have the first right to buy the property from you, but for whatever reason, they just uh, can't buy it from a bank right now. So they, they get a lease with an option to buy. And that basically means they lock in a price for X amount of time and they, um, they, they can exercise that option or they don't have to. Um, so it's an option to buy. Generally, this works the best in low crime areas. Uh, if it, and I put high, high crime areas, uh, you know, it has to be almost a rental all the time, uh, it, just because, or, or an office building, depending on, uh, the, the, the type of the, the makeup for the office, uh, that's just kind of the way that it is. People don't want to live long-term in high crime areas unless they absolutely have to, uh, unless their situation has to dictate that. So, uh, that's kind of like, if you're, if you, you know, look at the area. Uh, what is it by? What's the area type? And then what's the crime level? And you can kind of get a basis of what you could do. So be creative in these situations for sure. <clears throat> inside the property. So we've already looked at the outside of the property. Now we're inside. We're kind of looking around uh, a few. What is desired in this area but is lacking? So I already mentioned before that the fourth bedroom in my area is like the unicorn. Like if you have a fourth bedroom, you can charge 
a much higher rate and you're going to get a, a, a resident that's going to stay there a really, really long time. And they're not going to mess stuff up because they're just like, there's no four bedrooms in here. I cannot live without a four bedroom. So a fourth bedroom, maybe that's, maybe that's lacking in, in your area. Maybe a first floor bathroom or laundry. Uh, there's a lot of places that are, if you're an older person or maybe you have some physical difficulties, maybe you're handicapped, maybe, you're, maybe your tenants could potentially be handicapped, giving them a first floor everything is amazing. Uh, they can, they know for a fact that they can uh, do everything they need to do on the first floor uh, if you're in an area where there's a lot of two-story houses and they can have access to that, they will pick your property and pay a higher rate over someone else's that has, oh, the bedrooms are upstairs. Oh, the laundry's in the basement. Like, okay, so I got to go, if I want to take my dirty clothes off when I'm in my bedroom, I got to go down two flights of steps and then come back up two flights of steps. If you're a young person and you're in, you know, super great health, then that's no big deal. But if you're an older person or, or the person has like some sort of disability or handicapped, or maybe even just like a surgery, I mean, then they they might then they would totally look at those steps as just like daunting. It would just be a pain in the neck. So if you could potentially put a bathroom or a laundry on a first floor, it might be a good idea to do that. A garage or carport, if there's if it's lacking in that area, uh, it could be worth it to do that. High efficiency appliances, I, I generally do that when uh, the appliance that I am buying the property is I know it's just gonna it's, it's dead basically. I will up the, the, to a high efficiency appliance. And I'll put that in the notes of, of the description of the property, the high efficiency appliances. Great in the summertime, uh, lowest bills in the summertime type of thing uh, for your air conditioning or your HVAC in the wintertime. Like you're gonna be paying the least out of all of your, all the people around you. Uh, usable attic, usable attic is basically does, is it, you can, if it's bare, you could just put some insulation up there and then you can put drywall up there and you know maybe put some carpet down. Uh, generally, a uh, carpet in an attic is, is nicer because it kind of takes the sting of the cold up off of there and paint it. And now you have a, you have a potential uh, usable space. It might be not be able to be legally classed as a bedroom uh, because uh, it, it, how they class bedrooms in your area might be a little bit different. But if you could, if all it needs is a, a window and a closet, well, the window's probably already there and you can put in a closet and you're done. You have it, you now have a three bedroom that turned into a four bedroom type of thing. Finished basement. This is another situation that could be uh, potentially awesome. If, if the basement looks like it's in good shape and it doesn't take a lot to uh, finish all of it or part of it, uh, make that an option. That could be a play area for kids. If the, if the, uh, if the square footage is tight or an extra bedroom uh, or a game room, rec room, whatever they want to do with it, uh, you know, that adds value to the property and it also adds to the rent, which is nice. Fenced in yard. Uh, I, I'm a real big proponent of the fenced in yard just because nowadays you want to be able to throw your kids, you know, out the back, lock them in a fence, let them run around like crazy, get all the energy out of there when it's nice outside and, you know, not have to worry too much about um, them leaving or a stranger coming on the property because there is a fence there. So if, or, you know, uh, not just the kids, but the pets, like if they, you know, if you allow pets at your property, you can um, have the, uh, the dog go out do its business and come back and it's exercise, come back in and, and no big deal. <clears throat> Off street parking. That could be if you're in a big city or if you're in an area where, um, that parking is at a premium and you can provide off street parking some way, somehow, then, then make that, make that uh, an option that people could get up. Now, remember, let's go back to the area really quickly in this one. If you offer off street parking in a rural area, no one's going to care. And they're going to be like, why did you even put that up there? Like they're going to just going to assume that off street parking is there. They're going to assume that you have a carport or garage. If you're in a big city and you say off street parking, they might be like, oh, this is amazing. This is a unicorn. Let me call this person up first. Let me make sure this place isn't taken yet. Uh, exercise area is, uh, is that could be the thing in the basement that you have there. Um, you got to kind of watch to make sure that that um, this would be maybe for a multifamily or an apartment complex of having an exercise area where people come down, lift weights and whatever. Uh, that's kind of up to you. I just threw that in there as a potential. It could be that you just say, Hey, this fully finished ba basement could be used as an awesome exercise area. And that's it. Like providing equipment might be kind of a risky thing. and might be kind of a pain in the neck uh, to deal with, but, you know, setting that potential up could be the benefit right there. 
self storage or garage area. You know, in the rural area, they're going to be almost expecting this for that they have some extra stuff they, they got they need room to spread out. But if you had access to like, let's say you had an apartment complex in the in the city, and you put in a, a storage shed or a self storage in the like, whatever, uh, if, if it's not the bottom line is with all of these things here is that if it's not something that's 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 common and you offer it you're going to be way ahead of the competition almost all the time even ceiling fans in the in each bedroom like if you don't have ac in the house and it's too expensive to really pipe in the ac and you don't want to do that putting in an ac unit where the light fixture is already wired to that's like a couple hundred bucks and uh, people will notice that especially on the second floor and a dog run a dog run is basically a, a less expensive fenced in backyard. Uh, a lot of times I've seen this, but if it's, if the, the garage is detached from the house and it's like really close, it's kind of like, you know, boom, then boom, you could put in a fence between the garage and the house and have like a that little middle area where you would walk to the car uh, fenced in. And then with that, you would basically have a, uh, a dog run where the dog is uh, a small area where the dog can go out there, run around, do its business, and come back in. Uh, along with maybe you could have, uh, if you didn't have, if they didn't have a dog, you do it for kids and just go, hey, it's not a, it's not a big fenced-in backyard, but it's still nice. You know, here you go, basically. Uh, so uh, that's that's what you can potentially do inside of the property. So should I add it or should I not? Like, is it worth it? Well, you got to figure out how much more can you charge if you add that benefit. And how much will it cost to add um, in this benefit up front? And are there ongoing costs? So a ceiling fan is pretty cheap. That's going to be like, if you don't install it yourself, you have a contractor come in, I think it's going to be like maybe 200 bucks, like materials, labor, all that like to put in it. And if you can charge an extra 10, 15 bucks a month for like a ceiling fan and not have to put in an AC, like it's cheaper version of AC, then that's going to be definitely worth it. Adding an entire brick and mortar garage, that's going to require some real thought process. Adding a first floor bathroom. First of all, you have to have the space for it. And you also it also has to um it also has to kind of make sense financially that that that's that people are gonna willing to pay for that. Um how long would it take for you to get your investment back? That's important. I'd say if it's but if it's three years or less, then it's worth doing. Uh it also could and a lot of times investors just think about how long it's going to take for my investment to come back. Well, let's say it takes, let's say it takes five or six years, but with that five or six years, you're also going to be getting the top tier tenants in that area. It still might be worth it to do it. That's why I said value added to the property or long-term uh, residents are key. If you can put in, let's say a fenced in yard, and let's just say that it's going to take you eight years to get that money back. But in that eight years, you only have, maybe one or two residents live in that property versus not having the fenced in backyard and you have a tenant every, you know, one to two years, that is, you know, eight, four to eight tur uh, turns on, on a property where you have to go in there, clean stuff up, advertise the property. You got a vacancy rate, you're paying the utility bills. There's different ways to calculate this for sure. And don't just look at it of like, don't look at it just directly as ceiling fan to rent increase. How many years is that? It's not that simple of a math problem. That's the quick uh, back the envelope calculation, but make sure you're looking at it from a 360 degrees perspective of, am I going to get a longer term tenant? Are they going to be a better tenant? And uh, am I going to be adding value to the property? That those are really, really important things that you're going to be looking at. So guys, what do you think about this? Um, you know, what do you want to see more benefits uh, to, to adding value to a property? Like, you know, what types of weird properties have you guys run into in the past? Please like, comment, subscribe. We really appreciate it. it. Helps out the channel. And, you know, what else has stopped you in the past from reaching your financial freedom? Check us out at Facebook 9to5ers. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day.